Hello, BookTube. I have a tag today. I was tagged by the Perks of Books, and it's a very straightforward thing. It's almost unstructured. It's five quotes. Just pick five quotes you really like. Uh, and I did. I picked them quick because uh, otherwise it would be impossible <laughs> to narrow down to five. Uh, and the first one that I want to do, I'm just, the, the, just going to read them to you and I'll give you a brief context, is from Edwin O'Connor's great novel, The Last Hurrah, uh, about a... a fraught election campaign in a city that isn't named but is clearly early 20th century Boston uh, this is the new beautiful new paperback reprint by the University of Chicago Press and uh, the the election is between a, a normal up and coming politician a, a, a machine politician and Frank Skeffington a multi elected scoundrel <laughs> who's patterned on Boston's uh, James Michael Curley and who is a raconteur and a rogue and a living, breathing embodiment of the old style world of ward politics uh, that, that is vanishing. But he isn't sure. He's trying for one more election. And he isn't sure that world has vanished yet. And the, we go through the, the book as a comic masterpiece. There are set pieces in here that will have you chuckling in your memory for the rest of your life. Uh, and we get all the way to the end when it's election night. And the, the results from the wards and precincts are starting to be tabulated on, on a board uh, in the way they did in the old days. Uh, and something strange happens. <laughs> uh, what happened next was not recognized by everyone. Characteristically, it was Skeffington himself who caught the first sign. The Ward 7 tabulation had stopped. The vote from Gorman's ward continued to yield its comforting harvest. One by one, the other wards had begun to declare themselves. Now the blank spaces on the blackboard, one for each precinct of each ward, received their first chalked markings. Skeffington examined them swiftly with a sharp, professional eye. He had hardly begun the examination when he stopped short, like an engineer powering at full speed down a long, familiar stretch of track. He was jolted from routine by the faint, half-hidden gleam of an unexpected light. Instantly he retraced his steps. He saw at once that he had not been wrong. The light was there, tiny but unmistakable. Exactly what it meant, if indeed it meant anything, Skeffington could not as yet tell. It was nothing more than a small return from a single precinct, so small as to be almost negligible. Yet it had stopped him. It had flashed out to catch his experienced eye. Immediately he had seen that something was wrong. The precinct from which the return had come had never been a doubtful one. As far back as Skeffington could remember, he had always carried it comfortably. And moreover, he was carrying it now. Although this was, And this was what had brought him up so sharply. The margin of comfort was lacking. In this small, reliable precinct, the race was proving to be surprisingly close. He was barely squeezing by. In itself, this was not disturbing. The small, erratic fluctuation, isolated and unexplainable, was not a rarity in municipal elections and furnished no cause for alarm. Nevertheless, it was there. It had not been expected. It was unwelcome. And it might, just possibly, be dangerous. <laughs> and that, that tiny little trickle, that little precinct of that one ward, is the future coming knocking for Frank Skeffington. And he's the first one to see it. Uh, needless to say... I wholeheartedly recommend that you read this book, especially if you're an American. Uh, our next one is also political, and it's historical. It's uh, it's uh, George Dangerfield's great old book, the the strange death of liberal England. Uh, it's it's a little bit dated now. It's it's about you know uh, British politics at the turn of the 20th century. So. It's a tough sell on BookTube and elsewhere, but he is such a wonderful writer, just just an endlessly wonderful writer and as he's uh describing the legislative changes that are taking place in this the beginning of this modern era he pauses to talk for just a bit about the old king king edward who has just died uh and it it's a wonderful portrait combining scorn and affection in a way that you almost never see it done so well uh let's see here to the mass of his subjects, he meant nothing. Uh, this is this is the new king, uh, King George. Uh, to the mass of his subjects, he meant nothing. His father was a hard king to follow. Edward the Seventh represented in a concentrated shape those bourgeois kings whose florid forms and rather dubious escapades 
were all the industrialized world had left of an ancient divinity. His people saw in him the personification of something nameless, genial and phallic, the living excuse for their own little sins. And he had been a good king after his fashion. The blood of his ancestors, agitated by so many crises and so many loves, had taught him to combine duty with indulgence. Every beat of it was a warning to constitutional behavior. He was never tyrannical. He was never loud or ill-mannered. He was just comfortably disreputable. How right it seemed, under his kindly dispensation, that humanity's fondest sins should be drummed from church and chapel only to find refuge in the throne. Englishmen had never cared for a respectable monarch, witnessed the fate of King Charles, whom the commons executed, or of King Arthur, who, in idyll after idyll, received a mortal wound from Lord Tennyson. <laughs> Hardly knows which direction to strike it. <laughs> Next one is fiction. It's a novel and a novelist that you will not have heard of, and you should, because he's great. It's uh, L.P. Hartley. And this is a novel. This is a novella called Simonetta Perkins. But he is the author of. Well, he never wrote a bad book, and he's forgotten now completely. Uh, but this is a story of a young woman and her mother who go to Venice, and the mother is rather desperately trying to get the young her young daughter married. Because her, her, her daughter's not quite quite young anymore, and the mother is <laughs> is starting to get worried, and uh, the the lovelorn passions that that eventually envelop the daughter are the nominal plot of the book but the mother steals the show <laughs> just everywhere she steals the show and there's there's one moment here the daughter has refused a suitor uh and her her uh her mother suggests that perhaps the next time he asks she should give him a different answer and and uh, uh she says uh, I would be very inconsistent if I did. And her, her mother says, Who wants you to be consistent? When you're married, you can be consistent as you like, but not when you are turned 27 and unmarried and have a gray hair or two and the reputation of being as forbidding to decent men as the inside of Sing Sing Prison. I could say more, but I will refrain because you are my daughter and I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> uh, I highly recommend Hartley. I'll talk about him at length in some for some other video. Uh, next example, uh, uh, another great quote. I'm afraid a lot of these quotes are long, but that's that's just me. Uh, this is criticism, and it's one of the one of the greatest works of criticism in written in the 20th century, especially for poetry. If you want smart writing about poetry, this is the book to read. It's uh, Poetry in the Age by the great Randall Jarrow, uh, and at this. He writes about many contemporary poets of his day, and uh, at this point he, he digresses to talk about critics. <laughs> so, of course, I pricked up my ears. Uh, of course I do not mean that critics should all go out and try to have styles, or that we should judge them by the way they write, though an absolutely bad writer is at least relatively incapable of distinguishing between good and bad writing in the writing that he criticizes. It is his reading that we judge a critic by, not his writing. The most impressive thing about the good critic is the fact that he does respond to the true nature and qualities of a work of art, not always, but often. But to be impressed by this, you must be able to see those qualities when they are pointed out to you. That is, you have to be under favorable circumstances almost as good a reader as the critic is under less favorable circumstances. Similarly, the most impressive thing about the bad critic is his methodical and oblivious contempt for unfashionable masterpieces his methodical and superstitious veneration for fashionable masterpieces and their reflections. But to be properly impressed with this, you must have responded to the works themselves, not to their reputations. There is a critical dilemma which might be put in this form. To be able to tell which critics are reliable guides to literature, you must know enough about literature not to need guides. This is a less than half truth, but a neglected one. What we need, it might seem, is somebody who can tell us not which are the good and bad writers, but which are the good and bad critics. And half the critics I know are also trying to supply this need. In literature, it is not that we have a labyrinth without a clue. The clues themselves have become a worse labyrinth. A perfect navy yard of great coiling hawsers, which we are supposed to pay out behind us on our way to the darkness of, say, to his coy mistress, or whatever it is we're reading. <laughs> uh, needless to say or maybe not needless to say anymore, that, that like, a lot of what Randall Jell wrote is, is 
half brilliance and half cod swallowed. <laughs> but, since he's also talking about himself, he was a poet, but he was also a great critic. Uh, but still, the book is full of constructions like that, passages that you will just underline until the whole book is underlined. It's uh, heartily recommended. And what would a quote fest be without an example from a great work of literature? I'm referring, of course, to the seminal Meg Hell's Aquarium. <laughs> in, in this book, a Dubai prince decides that he's going to build the greatest aquarium of them all. And in order to make it that way, he needs a Meg. <laughs> uh, and in order to corral the Megs and understand them, he needs the hero from the first book. Uh, but our hero from the first book has his qualms about using 100,000 pound monstrous prehistoric killers as circus freaks. <laughs> Fortunately, his 18 year old dreamboat himbo son doesn't have those qualms and signs up <laughs> to help corral the Megs. Uh, but in the course of the novel, it's discovered that there's a whole prehistoric water world under the, under the ocean full of prehistoric monsters. Meg's not alone anymore. <laughs> And when the himbo son takes a submersible down to look at them, we get exposition dump after exposition dump. <laughs> and this is this is one of them. Uh, David, that's the himbo son, presses his face to the cockpit glass by his head, peering down past the port side wing, his eyes focusing on movement, his pulse pounding in his neck. The creature's dorsal fin was lead brown, camouflaging it in the sea its dark skin mottled in patches of ivory that turned stark white along the underside of its lower jaw and belly. The head, from the tip of the smooth crocodilian mouth to its short muscular neck, is as long as the juvenile sister's entire body and spans a full third of its gargantuan torso. Its jawline alone is 32 feet, its mouth filled with 10 to 12 inch dagger-like teeth. The fangs, located at the tip of the snout, are so long and sharp that nature has aligned them to jut outside the mouth at crisscrossing angles. Rippling along either side of the monster's neck are gill slits, each evolutionary adaptation 20 feet tall, enabling the ancient species of plesiosaur to breathe like a fish. The creature's midsection is as thick and long as a train car, possessing a reinforced rib cage that supports a muscular shoulder girdle, powering a pair of forward flippers twice the size and girth of a humpback whale's pectoral fins. The abdomen tapers back to a pair of rear limbs and a short, thick tail, the sleek design providing the monster with grace and speed. Leopluridon. David's flesh tingles as he whispers the name. His eyes wide as they take in the largest marine predator ever to have existed in the planet's four billion year history. And there's the picture. Oh. <laughs> Thrilling. <laughs> Let's see Dickens top that. <laughs> and there you go, book two. There's five quotes for your day. 